All right, today I'm going to be preaching about prayer, prayer, preaching about prayer. So the title of the sermon is Things to Pray For. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 5, this is one of our memory verses for prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice evermore, this pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, in Luke chapter 11, so the part of the chapter I'm focusing on is that first half where Jesus addresses prayer, the Lord's Prayer is there, and it's interesting that the chapter starts off with the disciples asking Jesus, teach us to pray. So we're going to go over the Lord's Prayer today as well, but also in the context of Jesus teaching them how to pray, he gives them this parable of this importunate friend, right? Like we would kind of think is like kind of nagging somebody, but... Look at the story here. It says, because this is what, if you're wondering, like, what, what does God mean when he says pray without ceasing? Well, these parables are here to give us a good idea of what he, how he expects us to pray. And he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves, right? So at midnight, so these people are asleep. And he's like, you've got a friend and now you're going to request something of them, some food. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. He's like saying, Hey, leave me alone. It's late. Sleeping. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. And I say unto thee, I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, his persistence. Let me see back here. Persistence. He will rise and give him as many as he needed. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give for a fish Give him a serpent. Or if, he ask, or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So we get, and, and there's another parable that's similar with the unjust judge. And the idea is that the persistence of the person asking, the person doesn't want to help them, but because of the persistence, they get what they want. And God is saying, well, look, if somebody unjust or somebody not unwilling to help you will help you because of your persistence and your importunity, how much more a God that loves you, right? So we sort of see this as, you know, maybe in in our lives, we see it as nagging. You know, it's like kids come along, you know, if you're a parent, and they just keep asking. And it's like, you know, maybe you'll get angry. This is why the Bible says that God abradeth not. He doesn't get angry with us. Keep coming, but you know, kids will keep coming eventually. I like feedbacking here, Kirsty. You know, um, <clears throat> I might just turn this down a bit so I'm not feedbacking as much. So kids, they 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 come, and you know, kids like they come and they they wear they wear you down, and eventually you just go, all right, I'll give it to you. So this is how God, like you think about it, right? God is using these analogies that we in our flesh find distasteful, right? Because we don't like people that are importunate. But God wants us to be like that when we come to him with prayer, to keep coming back. And even when I think about it with my kids, you know, yeah, maybe they ask for it and and maybe they'll wear you down. Sometimes you'll say no if it's best for them, but sometimes if they just keep asking, it, it may wear you down. But you know what it shows when a kid keeps asking for it? How much they want it. Isn't that true? How many times do you, know, you have, a, have a child, they ask for one thing, but then they forget about it? And then your thought as a parent is, well, they must, it must not really be that important to them. Isn't that true? It's like, it's like sometimes someone will ask me a question, and then he'll forget about it, and it's like he's on to something else. It's like, well, maybe he didn't really, really care what the answer was, right? Because he asked him once, it's off his mind. So it's the same, it's like if they ask for something, and then they completely forget about it, and they never ask again, your impression as a parent is, well, you know what? It's probably not that important to them. So what impression do we give God when we don't ask for things? Or we ask for it once and then just forget about it. Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe he knows it's not that important to you. 
because it was important to you, maybe you would be like the importunate friend. Now, prayer is like, prayer is an extremely difficult thing, you know, even for me. You know, I'm not going to pretend up here that I'm just like this prayer warrior, you know? Uh, you know me, I like, I like to take control of things, you know, like results, I'm a doer. And usually when people are like that, it's extremely hard prayer. Because you know why? People say, you know, some people think public speaking is hard and soul winning is hard. Everyone has their different challenges. But I've heard some people say that prayer is the most spiritual thing you can do in the Christian life because you, 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 when you pray, you are effectively relinquishing control of that thing that you're praying for, right? Because you pray for the things you can't control. So you have to have faith that, that in a God that you can commit that to and oftentimes you don't pray because you do everything yourself, you know? So it shows our level of faith. This is why prayer is, is quite a spiritual thing. And this is why it's very important that we are reminded from God's word the effectiveness of prayer because it's an often neglected thing in the Christian life. Because, you know, everything else in the Christian life people can see, you know what I mean? Like you're at church, you know, you're going soul winning. You know, they may know, like, how much Bible you know. But nobody really knows how much you pray, right? And you can, you can pass yourself off as somebody that prays. You know, maybe you think I pray more than I actually do. <laughs> but my point is, like, nobody really knows, right? Because you pray in your closet. You know, maybe there's public prayer as well, but the amount of prayer that's between you, you and God, people don't really know. So it certainly requires a lot of faith to depend entirely on God for something. All right? Now let's... I'm talking about things to pray. So that introduction is just, hey, the attitude we should have towards prayer. But today's sermon is more about, hey, I want to give you, if you don't know what to pray for, hey, here are some ideas of what to pray for from God's Word. So first, let's start at the Lord's Prayer. We saw that in Luke 11, um, and it's in Matthew 6 as well. That's why I had the scripture, because I originally wanted to read Matthew chapter 6, but now I like that parable, so I made the scripture reading Luke 11, forgot to change that first slide. Luke 11, 1, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, and now we get into the Lord's Prayer. So there's actually two times the Lord's Prayer is in the Bible, it's in Luke, and then the other one you're probably more familiar with that most people re repeat is the one in Matthew chapter 6. But some people... You know, they call this the Lord's Prayer. And I've heard as well, some people say, well, this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is the model prayer, you know, because it's, it's not really Jesus praying. He's telling them, hey, this is the model prayer, the things you can pray for. I heard that they say, you know, and I, I, I somewhat agree, the Lord's Prayer is actually, you know, John, I believe, uh, uh, 15, 16, 17, you know, when he's actually praying with his disciples in the book of John. So some people think of that. That's actually the Lord's Prayer, where over a couple of chapters you actually hear Jesus praying to God the Father and, you know, quoting, you know, quoted as like what he's praying for. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying that God be glorified, all these sorts of things. But, you know, that's uh, that aside, that's a technical point. This is known as the Lord's Prayer, and uh, this is the model prayer. So the Lord's Prayer is then, again, not meant to be something that's just vainly repeated. You know, like the Bible talks about, don't use vain repetition as the heathen do. So vain repetition is not being importunate like the friend and asking for the same thing that you actually really want. Vain repetition is when you're just reading words out of a book and just saying the same word, and you just think the amount of times you say it is, is like, a, like a chant. You know, like the pagan practice of just like chanting, 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 and they just think that if they just chant enough, they're going to get it, as opposed to actually asking a god that can answer your prayers. So you don't want to turn the Lord's Prayer into something like that, which is what a lot of the Christian denominations do today. They just repeat it vainly. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in earth, so in, uh, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us, give us day by day our daily bread. So it's even harder because we, we know the other Matthew 6 one so much. It's like, Hard for me to read this one. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And I, and I, I, and I, heard, I felt like George Gershon's 
odd pause at the end there because he was probably thinking the next few words are going to be, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. But in Luke, it just stops there. So Matthew 6 is the Lord's Prayer that we're more familiar with, that most people will repeat. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So here's a couple of things you can pray for, just even in the Lord's Prayer. And um, they all start with P. So first of all, one thing you can pray for is you can just praise God. You know, there's nothing wrong with praying and just telling God how grateful you are for him, how great he is. You know, sometimes it's good to remind you that you serve a great God, that God provides for you, things to be thankful for. So this is why it's like, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He even ends it with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a good thing to praise the Lord. It's a good thing to glorify the Lord. There's nothing wrong with praying and just praising God, giving God the praise due to his name. I mean, this is not something that's like a, a prideful ego thing. Like, in, like when we think of people giving praise, this is God actually deserving of the praise that he gives us. It's a, it's a reasonable thing. So you can praise God. What's another thing? Give us this day our daily bread. You know, I'd say most people don't struggle with this prayer, because oftentimes when we get into financial hardships, that's when we pray to God, right? You know, things aren't going well, and you don't know whether you're going to get that promotion, you don't know whether you know, you're going to lose your job, business is not going so well. You know, this is why we have to be humbled sometimes. Suffering is good in our lives. That's when you think about God, that's when you pray. Me too. You know, like when I'm going through hard stuff, this is, this is actually what sparked this sermon, because just going through a lot of things right now, I'm just thinking, man, I, I find myself sitting at my table just like begging God for wisdom. You know, wisdom in how to just deal with all these different things and manage relationships and all oh, these decisions that need to be made and oh, just like, uh, you know, just ask God, like, just help me. I just need, I need wisdom. So when we are brought down, that's often the time when we call out to God. All right, so here... What can we pray for here? That God will provide, provide for us. That he'll provide our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. What's this one? This is peace. Having peace with God. You say, what's one thing you can pray for? Well, do you confess your sins to God? You know, if we confess our sins, these are some of our memory verses. That's why they're in the memory verse list. Yeah, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You know, maybe you uh, haven't been walking the way you should. Or you've done some things that you're a bit ashamed of. Hey, one thing you can pray for, ask for forgiveness. You know, confess your sins to God. And you know that's going to help you in your conscience because you know the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So this is a bit different to the sinner's prayer, right? The sinner's prayer is accepting Christ as our Savior, being saved from the, from the penalty of sin, right? But when we talk about getting our sins forgiven, now it's a relationship between God, between us and our Heavenly Father. And just like you may ask for forgiveness from a friend or your spouse or your parents or a child, you're getting that relationship right. It's the same thing with God. Right? So we want, we want forgiveness. And we're also asking that we would have the grace as well to forgive those who have sinned against us. So it's not just peace with God, but peace with our fellow man too. So we want, that's another thing to pray for. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So the last thing there is, the last P is protection. Right? So that God will protect us from evil spiritual evil, things like that. So that's another thing that you can pray for. You can ask God to put a hedge around you and protect you from the evils in this world. All right, number two, number two. This is, uh, this is one that I, 
You know, I think it's super important. Uh, you can never have too much wisdom. Uh, first, a joke. <laughs> so there was this, this joke I was told, and it's just to introduce uh, what we're going to talk about here, that the story goes like this. One day, this guy, you know, he, he finds a lamp or whatever. I can't, I can't remember. I'm not very good at telling the first part of the story, but finds a lamp, genie comes out, Genie gives him the option of like, okay, you can have all the money in the world or all the wisdom in the world. The guy's thinking, he's thinking, he's like, he's like, you know what? I'll take the wisdom. And then Genie goes, your wish is granted. All the wisdom in the world. And Genie vanishes. And then comes over him. He's like, oh. I should have taken the money. <laughs> so... Look, that's just a joke, obviously, from the world's point of view, what they think about money. But that joke comes from the story of Solomon, right? Solomon, God appeared to him in a dream by night. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he hath walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So this is the real story, right? And the real <laughs> wise choice, right? Not the, the joke. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. So what happens to Saul? Why did, how did Solomon get him get his wisdom? This is the story. God comes to him in a, in a dream, and, and it's not the genie, it's not like the two choices. He says to Solomon, you can ask for anything you want. He says, whatever you ask for, I'm going to give it to you. And then this is how Solomon responds. He's like, hey, I'm like a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Right? He's, he's ruling over. This is the, the, the humility of Solomon in his early days, right? Because he, he didn't always you know, go well. You know, he had to ups and downs. Right here, he's ruling over the kingdom of, of the kingdom, but he sees himself as a little child. He doesn't have the wisdom needed to rule. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. So here's what he asks for. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life. So these are some things that people may like. Well, you know, long life. Neither hast asked riches for thyself. You know, like the joke I just told. Nor has asked the life of thine enemies. Right? Revenge on people that you want to be killed. But it's asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. But hold, I have done according to thy words. Right? So he's given him the wisdom. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like, like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So this is why Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. He asked for wisdom and God said, you're going to be the wisest ever lived from before, even in front of him. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Which means, when, you know, so he's saying here, you're going to be the wisest person ever, but you're going to be the richest king, you know, when, as you, in your days, all thy days. So that means there's people richer or poorer than him, but, you know, he's going to be the richest while he's alive. And if thou wilt walk in my ways... To keep my statutes. Remember the other one that people ask for is the long life? So he didn't grant him that one, right? So that one is granted by obedience to, to Solomon. If thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So obviously the last one, which is the life of your enemies, God doesn't do it all. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings offered peace offerings, and made a feast to all his servants. So when I think about asking for wisdom, 
you know, to me, you know, this is the one thing I probably pray for the most because I just feel you can never have enough wisdom. And wisdom is just so important in life. And as, even as you get older, you just start realizing just things aren't as black and white as you thought when you were younger. And just all the different factors that come into play and, you know, having to make the right choices at the right time for the right reasons. Um, you just can't get enough wisdom. So you need it in every area of life. So you're wondering what can you pray for? Hey, pray for wisdom. James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You see there, like when it says upbraideth not, that's the encouragement to come to God like that importunate friend. Right? See, we may upbraid. Like, you know, your kids come, you come, we've all been there. Right? Who those are your parents? Leave me alone. Tell them off. But this is how God wants us to come and pray to him. But it says here that God upbraideth not. Right? And it shall be. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that goes back to what I was talking about before. Like, how much do you really want it? And if you think about the analogy I talked about with the child, you see how that shows how much they really want it. And it's the same here. You know, if you're going to ask for something, ask, you know, and really want it in faith. Ephesians 1.15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So this is now Paul praying for others, but he's praying for God to give them wisdom, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? See, part of wisdom is really understanding the wisdom of God. You know, understanding. When you read the Bible, you understand it so you know how to apply it and your eyes being open to the truths of God and the power of God, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 6, this is Paul asking others to pray for him for wisdom, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So we got the Lord's Prayer. That gives us some ideas of what to pray for. Pray for wisdom. Hey, you don't know what to pray for? Yeah, maybe you need more wisdom. So you know what to pray for. See, that's like, that's, that's praying for a prayer so you know what to pray. Wisdom. You can never have enough wisdom. Right, number three. Number three. Something you can pray for is what you can't control. You know, I'm of the mindset that if you can, if you, if something is within your control, you don't necessarily need to pray for that thing to be done. You may need to pray for the strength to do it or the help to do it. But if it's within your control, you can go and do it. But certainly the things that you should pray for are the things that you can't control. Right? Here's another one of our memory verses. This is what we looked at with the kids this morning. Philippians 4, 67. Be careful for nothing. See, care in the Bible is not about uh, you know, being delicate with things and not dropping things when we think about being careful. Being full of care in the Bible is when you are worried, right? And the Bible's telling us here that we should not be worried about anything. It doesn't say be careful for some things. It says be careful for nothing. And why is that? You know, I was taught, and this has stuck with me, you know, a friend in Mexico told me this when I was worried because I could get my, couldn't get my wife on the flight back to Australia. So obviously I was worried, you know what I mean? I was, I was, I was stressing about these things. Yeah, I'm not perfect. Stop judging me. Okay? <laughs> but uh, no, I'm not perfect. You know, I stress about things, as you guys know. But you know, I've got to be reminded. Be careful for nothing. Why should you not be worried about things? Because 
If you can do something about it, then you do it and you don't have to worry. If you can't do anything about it, you can't do anything about it. So what does worrying change? So that's why there's never a reason to worry. You either fix it or you give it to God, but there's never a reason to be careful. That's why the Bible can say, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So why do we not have to worry? Because if we can't fix it, we have a God who we can trust will do what's right. That will either fix it or maybe not fixing it is the right thing. Right? So we don't have to worry. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is what I was telling the kids this morning. I don't know if they internalize it maybe as much as you guys will. I was saying when we commit things to God, we can have a peace that the world just doesn't understand. Sometimes we don't even comprehend. Right? But if we commit things to God, we can have a peace because we know that there is a God who's in control. Right? So this is why we can have peace and we can pray for things outside of control. We don't have to worry. Right? What are some things outside of our control? Sometimes it's health challenges. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. You see, that's good. You've got to sing. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. All right? So this is maybe an illness. See, sometimes we try our best to control our health, but sometimes it's outside of our control. What do we do? That's something to pray for, right? Maybe it's going through hard, hardships and persecution. This is Jesus, you know, as a man, obviously praying, but he committed to God what he was about to go through, Luke twenty-two forty-one, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. So interesting that Jesus asked, what he wanted was this cup to not go through the suffering, right? He didn't want to go through the suffering as a man. It's not like something he was looking forward to, but he submitted to the will of God, like it says in Philippians 2, right? He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Right? So he was willing to do God's will. So this is how we pray. You know, sometimes we go through hard times and persecution and things like that, but we should have this attitude. Not that we want to completely avoid it. We want God's will to be done because sometimes it's God's will for you to go through that, that because it's necessary for something or it's necessary for your growth so it doesn't get removed. You don't want to necessarily believe then that God's not answering your prayers. Right? Just like here. Now, God didn't remove the cup. But look at what he did to Jesus in 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. See, giving him the strength to go through that. So sometimes it doesn't always get removed. But these are things outside of your control. I've shared this one with you before, but this is another one. You know, having a child. You know, people pray for a child. That's one thing you can pray for too. But I want to encourage you here because sometimes people pray for you know, weeks, months, years. I've told you this story before, but not everyone has seen this. But this shows us the praying without ceasing and the importunate prayer. And Genesis 25, this is Isaac and Rebekah. It says, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. So just keep that number in mind, 40 years. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So now Isaac is praying that his wife can get pregnant, right, and conceive a child because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So you read those two verses, and you just think, oh, man, what a man of, man of prayer. Just like, name it and claim it, you know? Just like, pray it, and then, yeah, that night, it's conceiving, you know? No, no, no. It says here, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And look at this. And Isaac was three score 
years old when she bare them. What's three score? Three score is 60 years old. A score is 20 years. How old was he when he was entreating the Lord for his wife? 40 years old. Now, how many of us can say today that we have prayed for something for 20 years? Not many of us. Right? So you want to see a man of prayer entreating the Lord for his wife? We read that one verse. That was 20 years entreating the Lord and eventually the prayer was answered. Right? Gave, gave birth to, to twins. Esau and Jacob. 20 years later. So I just want to give us some perspective here. That yes, God answers prayer. We can pray to God. But don't think your one, two requests is what the Bible's talking about, praying without ceasing. You know, let's, let's really pray for things. And you know, that's why we have things on the prayers. I, mean, I don't mind repeating them. I'm going to keep praying for them. Because, you know, we don't know how long it's going to take. We want to be, we're going to be importunate. We're going to keep asking, keep mentioning it. And I want you guys to have that same attitude too. That, yeah, we've got to keep mentioning it because we want to be importunate in our prayers. Number four, there's two more. What can you pray for? Now, all these things we talked about that you can pray, obviously, for yourself, you can pray for others as well. You know, so if you don't know, you may not have a need in a certain area, but this is why we have the prayer list. But you know other people that have things that they're struggling with, things that they need and things that, you know, in their life, their struggles, and we put them on the prayer list. So you don't know what to pray for? Hey, why don't you spend your time in prayer praying for other people? You know, that, that's, you know, usually when we pray, I think our natural inclination is we are self-centered, right? That's the flesh. So when we pray, it's always when we're going through hard times, when we're going through trouble. We need to grow beyond that. When we are proactive in our prayer, that we actually pray for others, you know? And we, you know, we know what other people are struggling with and, and their challenges. And, you know, if we pray for them, hey, it'll make a difference. First Thessalonians 1, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. You see it all throughout Paul's epistles. He was praying. He's telling him, hey, I'm praying for you guys. Colossians 1, 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. See that? Pray without ceasing. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he's praying for wisdom for them. Right? We saw that in Ephesians 2 as well. Ephesians 1, sorry. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he wants them to have wisdom. He wants them to walk in the Spirit. He wants them to walk with the Lord. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Philippians 1 3. Philippians 1 3. Yeah? I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Can you say that about your brothers and sisters in Christ? I hope you can. You know, we want to love each other enough that when we pray for each other, we're like, oh, thank God that these people are in my life. Rather than plead, God, say, remove these people from my life. You know? So we want to pray and be like Paul. See, Paul loved the Philippians. He loved his brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And uh, this is something I say a lot. So, you know, it's, I'm, gonna be, I'm like Peter when I'm preaching. You guys that hear me preaching all the time just keep saying the same things. I'm not going to be negligent to remind you of these things. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. So the great thing about, that I love about this verse is it's very encouraging about prayer and the impact that our prayers can have on other people. Because we all know verse 6. We've all heard it, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, and they talk, usually talk about it with salvation, saying God started this work in you, he's going to work in you, he's going to finish it, you know, he's going to grow. And that's, that's encouraging, right? But what I like to think about when I think about this verse is why was Paul confident 
that Christ was going to work in his fellow brothers and sisters. Well, he explains it in verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all. See how it's suitable? He's saying it's right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart. He's saying I'm confident that God's going to work in you because I'm praying for you. See, so that's what I'm saying, that we need to believe that prayer makes a difference. This is why it takes so much faith, because we don't really believe it. That's why we don't pray. That's why we don't pray. If we believed it, we'd pray for other people, and we'd know that our prayers make a difference, make a difference in their life, make a difference in their understanding and wisdom of God's work, make a difference in their spiritual walk. So sometimes I wonder, you know, I don't know how much you guys pray, but you know, would our, would our church be completely different if everyone was praying for one another and really caring about each other's spiritual walk? I mean, maybe we'd, you know, you know, there was a scale of spirituality. Would we go from like here to here just based on the fact that we're praying for one another and we're praying for people to walk in the Lord? James 5.16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's what the Bible's saying here. You see, you pray, you're fervent in your prayer, you are importunate in your prayers, like we saw in Luke 11. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It makes a big difference. That's what it's saying. Then it uses Elijah as an example. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. You see, we think of these great men of the Bible, eh? they go through the same struggles that we do. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So here we're given an example of a man who had the same struggles, like passions as we are, and yet his prayers stopped the rain for years and then started it again. We want to be like Epaphras. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Heropolis. See, so Epaphras is a great prayer warrior in the Bible, where he is lifted up in the Bible for laboring fervently in prayers. Okay? Now, there's one more, one more. And I added this one because I just thought, like, this one's the hardest one to do. And probably none of us, maybe very few of us do it. It's not a pleasant thing to do. But yet it's in the Bible, so we've got to do it, all right? And that's to pray for your enemies, all right? It's easy to love people that love you, like the Bible says, but do you love those that don't love you? Do you pray for your enemies? So sometimes we think, ah, yeah, pray for the things, yeah, are you listening to this sermon? <laughs> pray for the things I need, yeah, these things are all good. Yeah, pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And now we're going to get to this last point. We're just like, I'm going to pray for my enemies. Yes, you're going to pray for your enemies. That's what the Bible commands us to do. People that do you wrong, you know, they need to have prayer as well. Matthew 5:43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Gosh, that's, that's so difficult. When we're reading this, you're probably reading this now, thinking, I don't even know if I've ever done this. <laughs> you know? Praying for your enemies, praying for people that, you know, do you wrong. But let me ask you, hey, do you want to be like Jesus or not? You know, we pray, I want to be more like Christ. This is what it means. You know, praying for those that persecute you and despitefully use you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. What is he saying there? See, God showers blessing on both the good and the evil. So he's using that to say, look, God, you know, even though the evil will one day get what's coming to them, 
but he still does good for them, just like he's expecting us to pray for them and do what's right, even if they do us wrong. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even publicans, do not even the publicans so. So we often think about this verse in terms of doing nice things for people, but prayer is the same, right? He's saying here, if you just pray for the people that you love, how are you any better than the publican, right, and the sinner? Because they do that too. But you know what takes your love and your prayer to the next level, like Jesus, is do you pray for those that hate you? If ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So I'm not up here pretending like this is an easy thing to do, but you know, I'm preaching on things to pray for, and I thought I wanted to challenge us all today and say, hey, this is not just praying for you and praying for the things, people you love. Hey, your enemies, we all would have enemies in life, you know, at work or wherever, people that do you wrong, people that have done you wrong, you know. You shouldn't only be praying imprecatory prayers for those people, you know. It's just actually praying to, you know, for blessings on their life too, you know. Luke 23, look at this, is, this is the example, right? Luke 23, 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they were, uh, there they crucified him. So these are the people nailing Jesus to the cross, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. We see here Stephen have the same heart as the Lord Jesus Christ when he was stoned. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So I don't think we have to get revenge for ourselves. I think we just can pray for those that do us wrong personally, right? We can pray for them and pray for their good. You know, it's like somebody, you know, does you wrong in life. That doesn't mean you should pray that they, like, their children die and all that sort of stuff. But you still bless, you know, you can still bless them. And and, and pray for their good, even though they've done wrong to you. And this is the sort of love God, our God wants our love to grow to. But see, we can take comfort in the fact, it's not that they will get away with what they've done. You know, praying for them and praying for their good doesn't mean that there isn't any justice. It means that we're committing that to God. There's a place for that. And Romans 12 expands on that. See, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. See, so what is the place of vengeance? It's just not our place. That's for God. So that's why we can be careful for nothing. We can pray for our enemies, because God is going to make things right if things need to be made right. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And I believe that's just a saying to say they're going to feel extremely guilty for treating you the way you do if you don't, right? You keep coals of fire on their head. You'll make them feel bad. Um, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So you see there that the way we deal with our enemies is not to avenge, right? It's to overcome evil with good. So even Paul had his enemies, 2 Timothy 4, look at this, Alexander Wilson, no. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. So you see there, that's, that's Paul saying, oh, he's giving place unto wrath. You know, he's not trying to get revenge himself. Of whom thou beware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. All right, so... We had the uh, Lord's Prayer, gives you some ideas of things to pray for. Praise, provide, peace, protection, wisdom, help with things you can't control, pray for other people, and pray for your enemies. But just a final thought in conclusion. You know, don't stress so much if you don't get your prayers just exactly right. You know, 
I think it's more important that we are praying rather, whether, rather than are we praying exactly right or are we praying for the exactly the right things. Obviously, you know, you want to know what you're praying for and things like that, but don't be careful about that because there is a, God has a safety net built in into prayer. Romans 8, 26. Look what it says here. Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Right? So he's saying here, the Spirit helps us because we don't always know what to pray for or how to pray for it. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So don't stress about whether or not you pray right, prayed the right way, said the right words. It's more important. It's not that that's not important. But it's more important that you just are praying. Because you know, even if you mess up a prayer, we have a translator, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, that's going to translate it right to God, you know, when the prayer goes to him. So there's this safety net built in. Hey, we just got to make sure that we are praying. So hey, make sure you get prayer lists. Make sure you're praying for one another. Write your prayer lists on there. Hey, give me your prayer requests. Hey, let's, we got to grow in all areas of the Christian life. One of them is prayer. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being a God that hears our prayers. Give us the faith, Lord, to pray and to trust you with our prayers. Help us to, as it says in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, to be careful for nothing, but to just commit things to you in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're not a God that is afar off. You're not an impersonal God. You're a God that cares about us and a God that hears us. And we praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.